Greetings, I'm Ryan Peterson, author of Judgment of the Nephilim and author of the forthcoming book, The Final Nephilim, my newest book, which will be the subject that we're discussing today in my presentation. Thank you so much for taking the time. I want to start by, of course, thanking our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ for this opportunity and special thanks to the Prophecy Watchers Ministry. You know, I've been working with Bob and Gary Stearman from day one of my career as an author trying to write about Bible prophecy, about the end times, about these issues that are so important. I'm so thankful um, to them and for their passion to truly point our eyes and our hearts to where they should be, to our Lord Jesus Christ in his second coming. He is coming back and it might be sooner than we even think. And so we want to make sure that we are watching and ready. So without further ado, let's start talking about the final Nephilim. So in my first book, Judgment of the Nephilim, I talked about Genesis 6, the sons of God, the daughters of men, the, the seed of the woman, the ultimate prophecy that God gave to when he sentenced the devil in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3.15, when he gave this promise of a seed who would come one day, a child born of a woman who would defeat the devil, who would bruise or crush the head of Satan one day. And of course, the mission of Satan from that point was to try and prevent that from taking place, to either prevent the birth of this Messiah, to corrupt this Messiah, or destroy this Messiah. And that's what Judgment of the Nephilim was about, the Genesis 6 invasion, all those things. And so now, we know, of course, that that has happened, that Christ was born 2,000 years ago, that he redeemed us, he died, he rose three days later to our, for our redemption, for our forgiveness. And so now, we're going to look at the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy by going right back to Genesis 3.15. We're going to look again at this prophecy, what I call the ultimate prophecy, but from the other side. Because when we look at this prophecy carefully, God told the devil, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Now, of course, again, we know that this promised seed is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the seed of the woman, the Redeemer. But there was another seed that was promised that God told the devil that his seed would have enmity or be at war with the Lord Jesus Christ. And who is that seed? Well, that is who the final Nephilim is, the Antichrist. And so I want to start, like I love to do, by looking to the history of our of our religion, of our faith, and look at the theologians from the church fathers in the first centuries all the way up to the 1700s and 1800s. And this was an established belief that the Antichrist would be a literal seed of the devil. So the first thing I want to look at is a quote from theologian Francis Tilney Bessette. He wrote in Things That Must Be, he said, in Genesis 3.15, we find the Redeemer of mankind promised as the seed of the woman. And we also read of the seed of the serpent, an everlasting antagonism existing between them. Now the seed of the woman is confessedly one, our Lord Jesus Christ. And consequently, the seed of the serpent must be also an individual. And as all the good are headed up in Christ, the representative man, so all evil will be headed up and will find its development in the seed of the serpent, the Antichrist, who shall come. Now, of course, we take the, we, this takes us to the book of Revelation, where we learn about the Antichrist, the end of the world, Armageddon, the judgments of the, the scrolls, the, the, the trumpets, the, the vials that are poured out by God on the unbelieving world, leading to the second coming of our Lord. But how can we understand Revelation? How can we make sure that we are looking at it in the right lens and understand? Well, you know, God, the Lord, in Isaiah chapter 46 gave us an interesting principle. And this is why I say the beginning is the end. That if we want to understand the end of scripture, we need to go back to the beginning. In Isaiah 46, God is rebuking Israel for their idolatry, their, their worship of the fallen angels, the demons who are the spirits of the deceased Nephilim, and their, their paganism, essentially. And God is demonstrating to Israel that he is the true God, the God of gods, as scripture calls him, the creator. And all these other false gods are just created beings. And what, look at what God says to demonstrate how he can prove that he is the true God. 
And we find this in Isaiah chapter 46, starting in verse 5. And we read, To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me, that we may be like? Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So what God said was the distinguishing factor that God is saying, I'm putting this, if you want to know that there's no one like me, look at what I've declared from the beginning. That God is telling us that if we look back to the beginning of scripture, that God has already told us how the events of the end times will unfold. And how is this done? Through types and shadows, through foreshadowing. And the way God will take prophecy and have it weave through time and actually recur. You know, sometimes we talk about a double fulfillment, but there are actually, most prophecies have multiple fulfillments leading to their ultimate conclusion in Jesus Christ at his second coming. Here's another verse that explains that as well. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, we read, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. So again, everything that's going to happen has happened already. In Hosea 12, God says, I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions, and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Now a similitude, again, is a foreshadow, it's a type, it's an example that prefigures something to come. Perfect example of this we find in the book of John, of course, when John the Baptist saw Jesus Christ the, uh, for the first time starting his ministry. John the Baptist declared, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So why did John the Baptist call Jesus the Lamb? And now we take it for granted because we know from our church studies from our Sunday school lessons. But at that time, think about this. He was calling him the Lamb of God to the nation of Israel. What he was saying was all the lambs, going all the way back to the Passover lamb, the first Passover during the, during the Exodus, that lamb that had to be sacrificed to save and his blood put on the lintel of the door on the top and the sides, on the, you know, forming the shape of a cross was a foreshadow of the true lamb to come. All the lambs that were sacrificed in the 1500 years from Moses to the time of Christ's first ministry on earth, they were just similitudes. But the real fulfillment was in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ our Lord on the cross for our redemption. This is a similitude. There are many other examples of these types in scripture. Of course, Joseph in the book of Genesis was a type, a foreshadow of Jesus Christ, right? He was the beloved son of Jacob. He had this special technicolor coat. He was betrayed by his brothers who were the patriarchs of the 12 tribes. Scripture tells us that Jesus Christ was, he came unto his own, his own received him not. Jesus, of course, was rejected as a nationally by national Israel, by the nationally by the 12 tribes. And just as Joseph was rejected by his brothers and sold into slavery, where he then rose to prominence from coming out of the prison and rose to prominence to be the second most powerful man on earth virtually at the right hand of Pharaoh. Jesus Christ, of course, died, went down to the grave for us for three days and rose and said in Matthew 28, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. So again, we're seeing these foreshadows. And of course, when Joseph came out of the prison and used his power, he saved Israel. And that is precisely what Christ will do at his second coming when he redeems and saves the believing remnant of Israel. These are foreshadows. See how God, when God, since God is outside of time, he sets world events in motion to give us glimpses into the fulfillment of his word. Other examples, of course, are Moses, who leads Israel out of bondage in Exodus to the promised land. Christ takes us from the bondage of sin to the promised land of heaven and eternal life. Joshua, who of course his name, Yeshua, in Hebrew is the same name as Jesus, is the one who crossed over the River Jordan and battled the Nephilim in all those wars, the 31 kings that Moses battled, thir two of them before then, to give us 33 kings of the Nephilim infested nations in the land of Canaan, 
leading the Israelites and fighting those battles. And of course, Christ will do the same thing when he returns, our Yeshua, our king, to fight the Nephilim at Armageddon and all the armies that support the Antichrist. These, again, are, t- are fulfillments throughout time of an ultimate prophecy. And God can do this again because he exists outside of time. And I wanted to take a time to talk about what, something very interesting that uh, I think is taking place. I think as we approach the second coming, as we're on the cusp of the rapture and the end times, the day of the Lord, the great tribulation, the world is converging more and more with Bible prophecy and even science. We see it with the move to, to uh, explore DNA, the genetic research, ex- you know, decoding the human genome and trying to evolve humanity. But we also see it even in physics, how quantum physics is trying to explore time. Where does matter originate from? And, and the old explanations aren't really adding up. And the, they're learning, scientists are now understanding what the Bible has known all along, that the creator of our universe, of everything, exists outside of time. And therefore, prophecies can ripple through time, coming up and leaving at certain times to give us previews of the fulfillment to come. And this is how we can know the end from the beginning. Just think about these examples. Of course, in 2 Peter chapter 3, God says in verse 7 and 8 that a day, one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Jesus Christ in Luke 11, when he was rebuking the Pharisees, he makes an interesting declaration. He tells them that they are guilty of the blood of all the prophets. And he says, which was shed from the foundation of the world. So the prophets who died were died before the world was even created. Similarly in Revelation 13, it says with respect to those who worship the Antichrist, the beast, it says that and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Again, it's saying that Jesus was slain before the world was even created. Of course, Jesus again in Revelation says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, said the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Notice that Jesus says that he's beginning and ending, but also says that he is which is and which was and which is to come, identifying himself as existing in the past, present, and future simultaneously. Similarly with the Trinity, another example that, the, that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit says they are three that bear record and these three are one. They are separate, but they're one. So how is the world understanding this? Well, in the most cutting edge science today, research, scientific research in quantum physics, there is a concept of this that they're just discovering and it's called quantum superposition. And I believe that this is taking a peek into what the Bible has been explaining for thousands of years. And so listen to this quote that will explain this concept very easily. Every particle, atom, and molecule, photons, electrons, or whole atoms behave in accordance with the laws of quantum mechanics, as does everything. However, this only becomes important when broken down to the atomic, subatomic, and molecular scales. Quantum mechanics is trying to use the physics of things at the atomic level to create effects in the macroscopic world, which is our world. Quantum superposition is a system that that says that has two different states that can define it, and it's possible for it to exist in both. For example, in physical terms, an electron has two possible quantum states, spin up and spin down. When an electron is in superposition, it is both up and down at once. It is a complex combination of both. And of course, this is one from one of my favorite books personally, uh, Quantum for Dummies uh, by Professor Alan Woodward. So what is this saying? That the scientific world is starting to understand that even in our physical world that they are observing, there are things when you break down are atoms that they are behaving, existing in more than one state and more than one time at once. And so it's almost that what the physical world and the scientific world are starting to understand is what the Bible says, that time for God isn't linear. Time is more like a scroll 
rolled upon each other, that is cycling over and over again, that the beginning is the ending and the end is the beginning. And of course we know in the end times, what will trigger the great tribulation? It's the opening, the unsealing of a scroll, right? Christ sitting down receives the scroll from the Father and opens the scroll and that will usher in the events of the end times. So now that we have this background, we can look to see what happened at the beginning because God is showing us that the events are going to repeat themselves and that's how we can understand Revelation and see it in this light. Well, Jesus told us. Luke 17, he says that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Skipping down a few verses, likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, and they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Days of Noah, days of Lot. God points us to certain events, and I think there are four of them that are the most pertinent for understanding Revelation and for us to, to decipher and rightly divide the end times that will, are the key to understanding uh, and interpreting Revelation. The first is, of course, Genesis 3.15, the judgment of Satan and the prophecy of the Messiah. Then you have Genesis 6, the days of Noah, the birth of the Nephilim, the invasion of the fallen angels, and the flood. The judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah and the Exodus. These four events will loop and cycle throughout biblical history and take us right to Revelation. I think when we view it this way, we'll understand exactly how the final Nephilim plays a key role in all of this. So let's see and examine scripture carefully again. So we look at this verse and we see that, again, that God said that this this prophecy of Satan having a seed will take place. And so we know of course, again, in Judgment of the Nephilim, I explored this whole concept of Genesis 6-4, the sons of God who saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took wives unto them all which they chose. They were the literal fathers of the giants, the Nephilim, the half-human, half-angelic hybrids. We also know that, and I established that spirit beings can conceive. Mary, you know, the, 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 the conception of Jesus was via the Holy Ghost supernaturally. So the seed of the woman was a supernatural conception, but with a human woman. And similarly, the Antichrist will have a conception from Satan with a human woman. And again, this was established and has been the understanding of the church for some time. So I want to read now a quote from A.W. Pink, uh, one of my favorite theologians from Gleanings in Genesis. And he writes on this exact concept. Second, Two seeds are here referred to. Another item which is generally overlooked, thy seed and her seed, Satan's seed and the woman's seed, the Antichrist and the Christ. In these two persons, all prophecy converges. In the former of these expressions, thy seed, meaning Satan's seed, we have more than a hint of the supernatural and satanic nature and character of the Antichrist. From the beginning, the devil has been an imitator, and the climax will not be reached until he daringly travesties the hypostatic union of the two natures in our blessed Lord, his humanity and his deity. The Antichrist will be the man of sin and yet the son of perdition, literally the seed of the serpent, just as our Lord was the son of man and the son of God in one person. This is the only logical conclusion If her seed ultimates in a single personality, the Christ, then by every principle of sound interpretation, thy seed must also ultimate in a single person, the Antichrist. So again, days of Noah taking us to the end times. Sons of God, daughters of men, fallen angels, human women conceiving in the end times. It will happen one final time, ultimating in the Antichrist. And what's his mission? Well, we have to remember, why is the Antichrist, why is he necessary? What, what is the plan? Because we already know he can't stop the Messiah from being born. The devil already failed at that. 
he failed at even understanding what Christ's mission was, because Christ intended to die, of course. And the scripture tells us that if the, if the princes of this world knew, meaning the princes and principalities knew, they would have never crucified him. But too late. So what, what is the mission now? Well, it's all tied to God's word, right? God said that he declared the end from the beginning. And God stated that the, the return of Jesus Christ, the return, the, re, the revealing, and that's why I love the name Revelation, because this is really about revealing Christ for who he truly is in his full divine glory. That's the revelation that's going to take place. But that's not going to happen until the Israel has been redeemed. So God has, has connected and latched on the return of Messiah to the redemption in the end times of Israel. And so this is what the devil is trying to prevent. Since he cannot corrupt the seed and prevent the seed of the woman from being born, now he's trying to prevent the Messiah's return by corrupting his nation, Israel. So let's take a look at this. Isaiah 62 tells us this. There are many prophecies where God connects his return to Israel's redemption. Isaiah 62, starting in verse 1, we read, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt be also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hephizba, and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. So look at this beautiful testimony God gives that he is not going to rest until Israel comes to that saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the true saving faith. So this is, this is a testament that God is saying he is waiting for this to happen, and when this occurs, then he will return. See more again in Isaiah 62. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto, unto the end of the world. Look at the context. Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, Thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. So again, the return. Jesus is coming, but you have to see him as your redeemer. It's when that redemption, that understanding, that faith takes place. And of course, Jesus confirmed this to Israel in his first ministry before he left. Before he returned to heaven, he said in Matthew 23, For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now this was on the cusp of Jesus being crucified. In fact, he's about to give them the entire end times prophetic sermon of Matthew 24 in, in the very next few verses. But he says to them, that since they had rejected him, since they had turned him over, rejected him and turned him over to be crucified, chose Barabbas over him to be freed, they weren't going to see him again. They were going to be desolate and suffer punishment and be scattered, which of course happened to Israel in 70 AD with the invasion by, the, by Rome and the destruction of the temple. But when will Jesus return? When they recognize him for who he truly is, Messiah. So this is all linked, and this is what the devil is trying to prevent and destroy from taking place. He wants God's prophecy to fail. He wants God to fail before heaven and earth, just as he did in the days of Noah. And this is where the Antichrist, of course, will step in. The Antichrist will be the ultimate deception. He will be, in fact, write a few verses right after that, when Jesus said, henceforth you won't see me until you say, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. Matthew 24 opens with the disciples saying, tell us, Lord, what shall be the sign of the kingdom and of thy coming? They want to know, hey, tell us, Lord, what is the sign of when you will return? And Jesus said, first, take heed that no man deceive you. Deception. And the ultimate deception, the great delusion, will be the Antichrist. And Jesus told Israel this as well. In John 5, he said, search the scriptures, scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, 
and they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. And then skipping down, he says, I am come in my father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own, his own name, him ye will receive. So the Lord told them, there is someone else coming before me, and that's who you're going to receive first, and that's the Antichrist. So how can we know what this deception is going to look like? Well, we can see, and how can we know what and who the Antichrist is going to be, what he's going to be like, why does he have his power? What is he? Well, Scripture tells us through foreshadows, through similitudes. One of the most amazing 19th century magazines on Christianity, and especially on Bible prophecy, was a magazine called The Rainbow. If you read Judgment of Nephilim, you know I quote that magazine often. They, had, they were the prophecy watchers of the 19th century, for certain. And so one of their articles called Foreshadows of the Antichrist During the Times of the Gentiles, they wrote this. Many and marvelous were the types of the Lord, and in the Lord's anointed before the angel of the Lord announced to the shepherds of Bethlehem the birth of Jesus Christ. And scarcely less numerous and marvelous are the foreshadows of the last Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the mighty being to whom Satan, the God of this world, in the closing days of this dispensation, will give his power and his throne and his great authority. So just as the Lord has his foreshadows and his type. Satan, the imitator, has woven in the foreshadows and, and, and types and similitudes through time of the Antichrist. And so we're going to look at one now in Judas. Now, of course, Judas, you know, his story and, and account in the Bible seems straightforward. He, of course, was the false disciple who was wicked, who betrayed Jesus, who sold him out to the Roman authorities and to the Pharisees to set him up to be arrested and wrongfully tried and convicted and sentenced to death on the cross. But there's a lot more when you examine Judas's life that reveals his connection to both Satan and the Antichrist. The first thing we find is in Luke chapter 22. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover, and the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, meaning killing Jesus, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve, and he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray Jesus unto them, and they were glad and covenanted to give him money. So look at this here. Judas was the only person we find in the entire biblical history that was possessed by Satan himself. Not a demon, the devil himself indwelled the body of Judas right at the point he was going to, to, to betray the Lord. Additionally, we see another connection. In John, in verse 70, Jesus said, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? In Greek, that Greek is diabolos, which is actually a definitive noun. So it actually means the devil. Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is the devil? And that term, diabolos, in the New Testament is only used to refer to Satan. Even in other versions, like the King James, which I love, where you see the term, I have a verse here from Matthew 8, uh, where they talk about possess, someone possessed with devils. That term is demonion in Greek. So that's where, again, it's distinguishing between the demons, who are sometimes called devils in Scripture, and the devil, Satan, who is diabolos. And this is what Jesus said about Judas. Another thing we find is Judas was the only other person in the Bible called the son of perdition. And we see this in John 17 when Jesus says this beautiful prayer for his disciples, for the church, and for all Christians to come. And as he's praying to the Father, he says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, referring to the disciples. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And that, of course, is a reference to Judas. And we know from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which is an end times prophecy, we read, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. Antichrist, Judas, both called the son of perdition. And of course, this means destruction in Greek. 
the ter that term perdition means destruction. And this is in line with the description we see of the Antichrist when that beast spirit, the fallen angelic spirit that emerges from the abyss in Revelation chapter 9, 11, is revealed. And it says, who says in the, that in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. That Apollyon, or Apollea, means destruction. So we see again the Antichrist linked to Judas. Now I'm going to read a quote from Clarence Larkin writing on this very idea. And he says, but why was Judas called the son of perdition? Was he a child of Satan by some woman? Or was he simply indwelt by Satan? Here we must let the scriptures speak for themselves. In John 6 we read that Jesus said, have I not chosen you twelve and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. In no other passage than this is the word devil applied to anyone but to Satan himself. Here the word is diabolos. The definitive article is employed and it should read, and one of you is the devil. This would make Judas the devil incarnate or the mystery of iniquity and explains why Jesus in John 17, 12 calls him the son of perdition. While perdition is a place, it also applies to an incarnation. It is a condition to which many men fall. And while men who have committed the unpardonable sin are sons of perdition because they are destined to the place of the irrevocably lost, yet Judas and Antichrist are the sons of perdition in a special sense, for they are the sons of the author of perdition, the devil. That is, they are not merely obsessed or controlled by the devil, the devil has incarnated himself in them, and for the time being, to all practical purposes, they are the very devil himself. Other similarities we see, of course, Judas was a thief. We know from Luke 22 that he was uh, and a liar. So he, he, Jesus said, have you betrayed the Son of Man with a kiss? Because the moment that Judas was going to uh, lead the Roman authorities to arrest Judas, he kissed Jesus on the cheek to greet him, pretending that he loved Jesus when he did not. He was betraying him. And then we see another example in John 12, when Judas appeared concerned about money, about ointment being used to uh, anoint Jesus, his feet that Mary was using. And he references that this ointment could have been sold for money for the poor, but scripture reveals that he was really, he held the bag, the treasury. He was the treasurer for the disciples and was stealing from their supply from the treasury, the money that was supposed to go to the poor, he was stealing for himself because he was a thief. And of course, Jesus tells us that Satan is a thief and a liar and a deceiver. So more links to him. One last thing to look at as we continue to explore this is the prophecies of Judas from the Old Testament. Now in Acts 1, when the disciples, the apostles were selecting a new apostle to replace Judas, they were, they were praying, they were getting ready to pray to the Holy Spirit for guidance. And it said, this is now Peter speaking, speaking of Judas said, now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem inasmuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, a kaldama, that is to say the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and let his bishopric let another take. So when Peter said that, that it is written, he was actually referencing two different prophecies in the Old Testament about Judas. One from Psalm 69 and one from Psalm 109. In Psalm 69 we read, Draw nigh unto my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of mine enemies. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before thee. Pour out thine indignation upon them and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. So here was the, the part where it said that his land would be desolate and that was the fate of Judas, this land he purchased, no one would occupy it. So that was one half. But the second half of that prophecy from Psalm 109 is even more mysterious. Look at what it says in scripture. Hold not thy peace, O God, of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. Clearly, this is a messianic prophecy of Jesus being betrayed. 
by the mouth of the wicked, referring to Judas. They compassed me about, also with words of hatred, and fought against me without a cause. For my love, they are my adversaries. Again, I, I highlight that Hebrew word there is Satan. But I give myself unto prayer, and they, they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. This is what Judas and the Pharisees did to Jesus, clearly. And look what it says next about Judas. It says, set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Scripture is telling us that the prayer for Judas was that the punishment would be that Satan, at his worst point, Judas would have Satan standing at his right hand. Again, linking the fact that Satan would be working in concert, and we know indwelling Judas at the time he's at his worst opposition towards the Lord Jesus Christ, exactly as the Antichrist will be. We, are, we know from, from Revelation 13 that it's Satan who gives the Antichrist, the final Nephilim, his power, his seat, his great authority. He, is, he, his, he has supernatural powers. He can perform miracles, lying wonders. All this is through the power of the devil. He will literally have Satan at his right hand, just as Judas, his foreshadow, did. We read here, from a book called The Retrospect from Oxford University in 1845, the reason alleged for the su supposition that Judas was a type of that last Antichrist, and perhaps the only type that occurs in the Christian dispensation, is derived from the fact that a portion of Psalm 109 is applied to Judas in Acts 1. While it is quite evident that the prophecy contained in that psalm is far too large here to be restricted to Judas, and must consequently point in its ultimate meaning meaning to the manifestation of evil in the person of the Antichrist, of whom it is said in the psalm, Satan shall stand at his right hand. So again, you see how God is weaving prophecy through time. It can actually come up here, a prophecy, a type can appear, disappear for centuries, and come back again, but all taking us to, in that cycle of time, to the ultimate fulfillment in the day of the Lord, in the great tribulation, at the second coming of Christ. One last thing to note about Judas is that another interesting thing that it said that when, that when the apostles were talking about you know, the fate of Judas and they're praying, it says, they write, they say about his death, they say that from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. That was the end of the prayer that Peter makes to the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1. He says that, he, that when Judas died, he went to his own place. So what was that place? Well, of course, it's talking about hell. He went to hell. Interestingly, of course, the Antichrist, at least the spirit that will indwell the Antichrist, as we'll get to, where does it emerge from? The bottomless pit. Here you see in Revelation 11, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. Revelation 17 confirms the same, that this beast that is the Antichrist comes from the bottomless pit. So we see many connections to Judas and the Antichrist as a foreshadow and gives us a picture that the Antichrist will be indwelled. And we also know he'll be a hybrid, and we see this in Nebuchadnezzar. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar is another foreshadow, this king of Babylon. Remember the Antichrist in the end times, his kingdom is Mystery Babylon the Great. So even in the names of the geographic areas, we see the connection. But of course, there's, just, there's even more than that. In 1 Kings 24, we see here that Nebuchadnezzar was sent as a punishment to God. Of course, in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah warned the nation of Israel, the, the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, over and over again, that if they do not repent of their sins, their wickedness, their worship of the fallen angels and the demons, that God was going to send Nebuchadnezzar as an instrument of judgment against Israel. And it says here that God sent them, meaning the Chaldees led by Nebuchadnezzar, Chaldees being the Babylonians, against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants, the prophets. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah. So he was an instrument 
of punishment. And that is exactly what the Antichrist will be. The Antichrist will be a tool in Isaiah Chapter 10 and 11 says that he calls, it refers to him, the Assyrian, who is the angelic being that will indwell the Antichrist. It says that he is the rod of my anger. So God is using him. He is just being used as a tool. Nothing is outside of God's control. Nothing is outside of God's authority. Even the Antichrist himself, he has a limited authority. God has numbered his days and he's being used as the tool that will chasten Israel that will be the furnace to, to refine that one-third believing remnant that will call out to Christ as Messiah. So even the Antichrist himself is under the control and authority of God, just as Nebuchadnezzar was. Nebuchadnezzar, of course, also had that, that infamous uh, dream uh, in Daniel chapter 2 of the statue with the head of gold, torso of silver, body of, of brass, and legs of iron, and... Uh, feet of iron and miry clay, that in that final kingdom, those feet of iron and miry clay and the ten toes were a foreshadow, a vision, a prophetic vision of the end times kingdom of Antichrist. And of course, in Daniel 2.43, we have the verse, and whereas thou saw the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another. So again, we see this connection between a foreshadow telling us that in the end times, we're going to see not just the Antichrist, but the Antichrist and a kingdom that is based on mingling the seed of men, as it was in the days of Noah. We're going to have the fallen angelic kingdom, which will be ruling in the end times, led by a Nephilim, the Antichrist. And of course, we have the statue of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar builds this golden statue of himself, in the plain of Dura and demands worship under penalty of death. And of course, this is a clear foreshadow of the Antichrist who, with the false prophet, uh, constructs the image of the beast. And the Antichrist will go in the midpoint of the final seven years, declare himself God in the temple, proclaiming himself that he is God, showing himself that he is God, and demand worship by penalty of death. This, of course, again, is seen in Daniel chapter 3. And this is a clear foreshadow. The image, of course, not only foreshadows the punishment of mandatory worship of this ruler, this king of Babylon, who was a foreshadow of the end times king of Babylon, but also even connects to the mark and the number of the beast, right? Because we know that in scripture, Revelation 13 tells us the number of the beast, 666, 600, three score and six, is the, this, this mystical number. Well, we see this foreshadowed in Daniel chapter 3, in that the statue, of course, that, that Nebuchadnezzar built was 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide, and it took six instruments to signal this mandatory worship. So even in that, we see these foreshadows and ripples through time of the coming Antichrist and helps us to understand the end times. Nebuchadnezzar also lived as a hybrid, and we find this in Daniel chapter 4, where he has another prophetic dream of this tree, this great and mighty tree, that the watcher angels, again, the watchers take us back to Genesis chapter 6, because they were the angels who the book of Enoch points to and says they were the angels who committed this sin. We have watcher angels telling Nebuchadnezzar that this tree will be hewn down and, put, and, 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 and wrapped in a band of iron and brass. And this will just be a stump. So they proclaim, nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass. And then they say something very interesting. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. So they proclaim this judgment that, Nebuchadnezzar would be literally transformed into a half-beast, half-human hybrid for seven times or seven years. And it says the same hour this thing was fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And of course we know Scripture goes out of its way to explain that the full career in the end times of the Antichrist will be seven years. The first three and a half years, him building this relationship, deceiving Israel into believing he's their savior, their messiah, and then, of course, the second three and a half at the midpoint when he is uh, wounded by a mortal wound and then satanically brought back to life. 
and then becomes the full-fledged beast, the hybrid satanically indwelled beast for the second 1260 days or three and a half years. Scripture tells us that it's these seven years, the seven years that the covenant established in Daniel chapter nine. And here we see Nebuchadnezzar for seven years living as half man, half beast. And this takes us to the description of what the final Nephilim is. He will be both the seed of Satan and possessed by a fallen angel. At the midpoint, once he is killed and suffers this mortal wound, it is during that time that the spirit of Apollyon, Abaddon, the Assyrian of the Old Testament will emerge from the abyss and indwell him. So like, like Nebuchadnezzar, he will be half man, half beast, and that he will be a hybrid, the seed of Satan and the seed of a woman. But like Judas, he will be indwelled by this fallen angel who's presently locked in the abyss. The Assyrian who in judgment of the Nephilim, I explained in detail from Ezekiel 31 that this was the being the angel who led the rebellion of Genesis 6 that, and the fornication of with human women and the birth of the Nephilim. And this will all take place at the fifth trumpet of Revelation chapter 9 when the bottomless pit is opened, the first of the three woes of Revelation. And this takes us right into chapter 9. And we see here it, that we read, it says, I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in Greek hath his name Apollyon. So this is the moment. This is the point where the final Nephilim becomes the Antichrist who tries to take over the world and starts the terror campaign that we see described in Revelation 13, where he forms a one world government, one world religion, and one world economy, all centered on him as the false god of the world. And so this is, and so we identified him, this being as the Assyrian, that Apollyon that's referred to, this fallen angel who will indwell the Antichrist was prophesied all through the Old Testament as the Assyrian. Here you see the verse again from Isaiah 10 where it says, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against an hypocritical, hypocritical nation and the people of my wrath will I give him charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Now remember, there's a prophecy that the temple in Jerusalem will be tread by the Gentiles for 1260 days. We see that in Revelation 11. So again, this prophecy is telling us what the Assyrian is going to do in the end times. It continues by saying, how be it he meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few, destroy, Abaddon. Again, scripture is telling us from the beginning that this being from Genesis 6 is actually the fallen angel who will indwell the Antichrist. And again, I explain this in Judgment of the Nephilim in Ezekiel 31, what he did in the days of Noah. And of course, in Ezekiel 31, it says that he was a cedar in Lebanon, that he compares him to a tree just as Nebuchadnezzar was. And it says that he had all the nations were under his branches. Everyone, everyone was under his rule. Thus he was fair in his greatness, in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. And again, as I explore this, what, we, what lets us know that this is an esoteric passage referring to a fallen angel, it tells us, as we continue in Ezekiel 31, it says that the trees, uh, I have made them fair, I'm sorry, and it says that the cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. 
The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in beauty. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. So this was his fate. This was a fallen angel who usurped uh, authority and took control by leading this invasion in Genesis 6 to, take, to, to corrupt the human genome by taking human wives and fathering the Nephilim and taking over even the Garden of Eden. This was the Assyrian, and he's going to come back again in the end times as the spirit indwelling the Antichrist. But there's good news because Isaiah 10 also prophesies the redemption of Israel through this time of testing. It says, and it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob unto the mighty God. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. So this is where it's all leading. The devil thinks he's going to be able to to seduce Israel into abandoning God and literally worshiping his seed as Messiah to prevent the return of Christ. But God has already told us that in this great tribulation, there will be a remnant that will believe and return to God and fulfill the prophecy allowing Jesus to return. It continues by saying, for yet a little while, and it says, look what it says, all my people that dwell in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrians. So God's already telling Israel thousands of years in advance, don't fear the Antichrist, for he will smite you with a rod and shall lift up his staff against thee, against thee after the manner of Egypt. See, again, a reference to another foreshadow, Egypt, the Exodus, Pharaoh. In my next presentation, I'll get into all the prior incarnations of the Antichrist through scripture in detail. But here we see another reference to it. For yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease, and my anger in their destruction. There's a beautiful rest and redemption and restoration. The revelation of Jesus Christ is the restoration of God's family. Yes, there's a war. Yes, there are going to be intense, severe judgments. But it's leading to a beautiful reconciliation. Even the way the Antichrist is destroyed in Isaiah 11. This is, all, this is all about the Antichrist, all this. And he's called the Assyrian, the same fallen angel from Genesis 6. And it says that God will, will the, the, the stem of Jesse, a branch, this is Jesus Christ, Yeshua, our Lord. It says that he will smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. The breath of his lips. This is exactly what we see in the New Testament, that the wicked shall be destroyed, right, by the breath of Christ, by the brightness of his coming. The mere appearance, the mere revelation of Jesus will overwhelm and destroy the Antichrist. And here's a passage, again, coming from a 19th century theologian that says that this wicked or wicked one is the Assyrian or Antichrist previously alluded to would seem obvious from the whole tenor and connection of the passage, but it is placed beyond doubt by the parallel passage in the second epistle to the Thessalonians, the second Thessalonians chapter two. We have a precisely similar announcement in reference to the Assyrian or the man of sin, both as to his end and the time when it shall come to pass. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the breath of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The parallelism between these passages is perfect, and the identity of the persons alluded to unquestionable. The time is the same in both. The time of the coming forth of the Lord, the character of the adversary to be destroyed is the same in both. The wicked one and the nature and mode of destruction is the same in both. The breath of his lips or the spirit of his mouth. Clearly, then, we have in Isaiah 10:4 a plain prediction of the destruction of Antichrist at and by the coming of our Lord. And that's from Israel's Future by Capel Molyneux in 1853. So again, it's telling us, look how amazing Scripture is. God has declared the end from the beginning. So we see again, the Antichrist has been here before. 
that the final Nephilim, like Satan and Judas, will be indwelled. He will seek to deceive Israel. He'll be, he has possessed human beings before. And when he emerges from the bottomless pit, he does not come alone. He comes with the other fallen angels from Genesis 6, who of course have been locked in the abyss since the days of Noah, since the days of the flood. Now here's something that's really just fascinating. In Judgment of Nephilim, I explain that the way we can know that Ezekiel 31 is connected to the days of Noah is by looking at the judgments of the end times, particularly the fifth trumpet. Now, now we know from the book of Jude, from 2 Peter chapter 2, it's that those angels are reserved in chains under darkness. These particular faction of angels who fathered the Nephilim with human women are locked in the abyss right now. Not the devil and the rest of those angels who didn't commit that sin yet. They're still free to roam the earth and seek whom they might devour. But these particular faction, these apostate angels of Genesis 6, have, were judged immediately at the flood, dragged down to the abyss, and locked in chains under darkness. But we see in Revelation chapter 9, the fifth trumpet, the abyss is open and they emerge. Again, it says even the smoke, it says here, you see in this passage that there's smoke of a great furnace. Remember, we saw even a reference to the great furnace smoke earlier in our, in our study. And that, so when the abyss is open, the smoke comes out. And, I, and I, I, this smoke is the same supernatural darkness the angels are currently locked in. It's so powerful. It's like a smoke, like the exodus darkness, that you could feel it. Remember they said in the exodus, when, the, when God sent that judgment of darkness, he said you could touch it. It was so powerful. It was physical. And it's going to blacken out the sun. And you see these locusts emerge on the earth. And what I explained is that in Judgment of the Nephilim, is that it says that the fifth trumpet, these locusts, these hybrid grotesque beings who are just the degraded forms of the fallen angels of Genesis 6, it says they torment the earth for five months. So why does that matter? This is connected to the judgment of the angels at the flood. In Ezekiel 31, God said, in the day that I punished the Assyrian, I restrained the floods and they abated, the waters abated. So we know from Genesis chapter eight, the flood waters abated after 150 days, five months on the Hebrew calendar, every month being 30 days. Again, when these angels are released at the fifth trumpet, so they were tormented by the flood waters. Their, their kingdoms fell apart. They saw their Nephilim children drown. They then were dragged down after 150 days of the torment of the flood waters raging into the abyss to be locked away for millennia. In the end times, they are released. And what do they do? They now torment unbelieving, the unbelieving world, those who aren't marked with God's seal for five months, 150 days. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. The end is the beginning. The beginning is the end. Amazing. But guess what? It, that's just the beginning of it. So we see here that the five months of torment, this is also the same time that there's the Revelation 12 war in heaven. So you have the angels being released from the abyss, and then you have Michael, the archangel, fighting a war against Satan and evicting his Satan and all his angels get evicted from, from heaven for good. And the scripture says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because now the devil is on earth permanently. He is no longer allowed to access heaven or his fallen angels. And this is, this is when the delusion comes to the full, because now the Antichrist is here as well as the fallen angels. And who knows how they present themselves? They might present themselves as beings from another planet, coming to save us, coming to redeem us, to give us world peace and uh, the solution to all our problems. But we don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be a supernatural deception. And notice it's just like the flood. The floodwaters came from the fountains of the earth and the windows of heaven opened during the flood. Water came from the sky and below. The end times flood will be the fallen angels coming from below, from the fountains of the deep, from the abyss, and from heaven when they are cast down permanently. And of course, this, this army, this locust army, was prophesied in the book of Joel as well. The book of Joel says that in the day of the Lord, which is the, the biblical reference for the great tribulation, the day of the Lord, it says, a great people and a strong, there have been none the like. It says, blow the trumpet in Zion, the alarm. This is the time of the trumpet being sounded. When we talk about the last trump, it's the, the, the silver trump 
And the book of Numbers is this trumpet of alarm. And God says, when you blow that trumpet, I will come. It says, the people great and strong, there have not been ever like, neither shall be any more after, even to the years of many generations. This is the locust army that's going to torment the world and, and, and will be something the world has never seen before. Reverend Robert Govett, one of my favorite theologians, um, wrote of this, but when the judgment of God shall come, he shall send, as he himself says, the angels with a great trumpet, and they shall gather his elect from one, hand, from one end of the heaven to the other. He, the Lord, shall inflict punishments on those who are to be punished by hostile powers as by means of executioners. He gives commandment to the angels about him to open their prison that they may depart and execute vengeance on the ungodly. And Jesus, of course, said there'll be great tribulation as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor shall ever be. This is when the, uh, these angels are revealed to punish the unbelieving world. It's going to be unprecedented and supernatural. And of course, Joel too connects them that they're locusts, they have breastplates of iron. Remember the iron kingdom was the end times kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar prophesied of. That connects with Joel as well. But there's something else too, the sixth trumpet. So, the, so we see the first fifth trumpet is a, is a reenactment of the judgment of the days of Noah. This torment for 150 days. But look at the sixth trumpet. And this is the mystery, I call it the mystery of the four angels of the river Euphrates. There are four angels who are released at the sixth trumpet. Let's look at this and try and really unpack what God is revealing, this mystery here of these four angels. And we read again in Revelation 9, and the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these, the three, by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. Fascinating, horrific judgment. But what is the meaning of this? What is the meaning of of these four angels. Why were they prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year? And why do they slay a third part of men? Well, again, God has declared the end from the beginning. When we go back to the beginning of Scripture, we can see, what did Jesus say? He said, as it was in the days of Noah, but also as it was in the days of Lot. The fifth trumpet represents the judgment on the days of Noah. The sixth trumpet represents the judgment in the days of Lot. How can we know this? Well, we look at the numbers. He that hath wisdom, let him count. That's what we read in Revelation 13. Again, on the Hebrew calendar, I explained before in the Hebrew calendar, like we saw at the fifth trumpet, every month is 30 days. Well, when we count this verse, we see the angel prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year. So a year in the Hebrew calendar is 300, 360 days plus a month is 390 days, plus a day would be 391, plus one hour takes us to the 392nd day. 392. Where do we find this number in scripture? We go back to the days of Noah, go back to the flood. And we'll see an interesting pattern in the genealogy given to us after the flood. Now we know from scripture, from Genesis 11, that our, uh, that our Faxid was the first patriarch in the lineage of patriarchs born after the flood. He was born two years after the flood, so we can time from his birth, and we see that next was Selah, 35 years. 30 years later was Eber. 43 years later was Peleg. 30 years after that, Ru. 32 years after that, Serug. 30 years, Nahor. After that, Nahor begat Terah, 29 more years. And then 70 years later, Abraham was born, Abram. And then after that, 
when Abraham was 99 years old, that was the day that God, Jesus, appeared to him with two angels at his home to announce the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah that was going to happen the next day. When you add that up, it's 392 years from the flood to the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. Fifth trumpet, judgment of Noah. Sixth trumpet, judgment of Lot, the days of Lot. And what do we see here? Of course, we know that the next morning, because it says the sun rose upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. And of course, again, we see in the days of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, what was taking place. It was human beings, and yes, there was sexual sin. Their sin had reached to heaven, that God had to come down and judge. Think about this. God is coming down to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. In the second coming at the Revelation, it's God coming down to judge the unbelieving world. Look at the repetition through time. It's all similitudes and types and shadows throughout biblical history. And what were they doing? They, was, they were trying to fornicate with angels as well. So we see here these angels, these four angels, they destroy a third of humanity, the 392. And now this connection if it still doesn't seem like, wait a second, could this really be the case? Is this really connected? Well, take a look at this. Scripture goes even further to, conform, to confirm that this is a repetition of the judgment of the days of Lot. We read in Genesis 19, the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. And how does God punish Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord of heaven. It was fire and brimstone that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah utterly. How do these four angels slay a third part of humanity? Again, going back to Revelation 9, the sixth trumpet, it says, And by these three, I'm sorry, it says, The heads of the horses were as heads of lions. And out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three were the third part of men killed, by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. The same exact judgment. Fire and brimstone at the sixth trumpet as we see in the days of Lot. What a remarkable, remarkable fulfillment that we saw going all the way back to the ancient times. God is amazing, and the Bible prophecy is amazing. And so when we can see it this way, it opens up the book of Revelation and what's going to happen in the end times. So there's much coming. God is going to unleash judgments this world has never seen. The fallen angels are going to return and openly manifest and deceive the world in a manner never seen and point everyone to a false messiah, the seed of the serpent, the final Nephilim, who will deceive much of this world and make them take his mark. Why? To corrupt them again. And I get into all this in the book, but to corrupt them again genetically, that they will be disqualified from salvation when they take the mark of the beast. But the good news, again, is that God will have his remnant. And we, when he returns as revelation, will be with him. We have to remember this. In Luke chapter 21 says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We have a rapture, a glorious reconnecting, being collected and meeting with our Lord in the clouds to be with him and be in his chamber worshiping him during these events. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. The angel told Lot, when he was taking Lot, we know Noah, of course, got on the ark, and for seven days before the rain started. Again, another fulfillment, a shadow. Seven days he was shut in the ark, and God shut the door to protect him supernaturally. Just as we will be for those seven years, the angel told Lot, Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Lot had to get out of the city first, and then the judgment came, and we will escape as well, and we will meet our Lord in the air, our ark, our safety, our rock, Jesus Christ, and we will be lifted above the earth as the ark was one day. The Lord will descend with a shout and come for us. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord at the trump of God. At that last trump, we will be called to heaven. So we must remember this. 
And what should we do with this knowledge? How then shall we live? We should comfort each other. We should comfort one another and use this time, redeem the time, to bring more people on the ark. Noah didn't just build the ark. He was a preacher. He was pleading with the world until that day that God closed the door. Jesus is going to close the door soon, beloved. We know the truth. We understand that a deception is coming this world has never seen, that Genesis 3.15 is going to reach its ultimate fulfillment when the war between the two seeds will be completed and our Lord Jesus Christ will be victorious over the Antichrist, over the final Nephilim. Share this word. Let people know Jesus is returning and let us all be comforted and prepared with our eyes watching and waiting for his glorious revelation. Thank you. Thanks again for taking the time to listen to this presentation. And now I am so excited at the last Trump 2020 conference by Prophecy Watchers to present the premiere of the trailer for The Final Nephilim. Mm -hmm.